Welcome to this episode of Kyber Clips. I'm Mike Jafrida, President of Kyber Security, joined by Bob Thomas, Chief Information Security Officer <laughs> of, uh, of Kyber Security and, and uh, for our clients. Um, today we're going to tackle a topic which uh, seems to come up just about every, maybe if not every day, at least every, every week, week. With, uh, with our clients, um, and, and that's cyber insurance. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what it is, how it's changed and evolved, and uh, maybe some of the hurdles that you might be coming up against um, in trying to get cyber insurance, the kinds of things you can do to try to help make that a, a less painful and hopefully less expensive process. So, um, Bob, maybe you can just start by telling us a little generically about cyber insurance, what it covers, why do people get cyber insurance? So, uh, in a nutshell, people are getting cyber insurance as a safety net, as a backstop is usually what the carriers and the insurance agents call it. Uh, if X happens, if you get hit with ransomware and you have to pay the ransom, are you going to have to go out of pocket for the whole thing? If you have cyber insurance, the answer is it's definitely not no or straight away no. It's maybe you will have to go out of pocket or maybe they're going to cover a portion of it. I'd say it's unlikely you will go unscathed. Um, there's going to be, just like with any insurance policy, there's going to be a deductible. There will be maximums. Uh, there is a maximum per incident. There's a maximum over the lifetime of the policy. It's protections against unplanned incidents. And these are typically... Uh, cyber threat or cyber, uh, I, I think it's really, technology has gone awry. You take an outage in your business. You have business interruption insurance. Okay, well, how was that outage triggered? Was it ransomware? Was it malware? Was it a machine failure? There are different ways that cyber coverage can step in. Did you click on a link and somebody took control of your machine and sent eight emails to your customers and said, you owe this money and send it to this location and your customers are sending money to the wrong location, not your bank, they're wiring it to somebody else's bank. Somebody in your organization was asked to create, go get 10 gift cards to Amazon for 100 bucks a piece, we're gonna give a spiff to all the sales guys, great. Give me the codes when you uh, when you get those. <laughs> you hand over the codes. That sounds normal. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean it's a standard request, right? Bang, the money's gone as soon as you give those codes out. It's history. And, it's and these so, things. So, uh, in there, it will. Is every policy going to cover all those things, or is there specific language in each policy about the uh, types of things? It, I mean, I, it is, I should I should make it clear we are not insurance experts here, but we see enough cyber liability policies and claims to be able to talk generically. Um, about yeah, I, I think that, you know, what holds true in a lot of circumstances is uh, not all things are created equal. Um, your mileage may vary uh, is a common comment about this stuff. Every policy is different. Uh, if you're shopping for a policy, you ought to be looking for something called a standalone policy now that is not commingled with your property and casualty, it's not a rider, it's not an addendum to that. This is a policy specifically around cyber coverage to be able to make sure that when something happens, you wire 50,000 to the wrong place and that money's gone. Trust me, it will happen on a Friday afternoon. You won't catch it till Monday and there's no way you're getting that money back. 99.999% of the time it's gone because by then it's offshore. Uh, they have transferred it three times, and it, it won't come back. Are you protected for that? Again, let's go back to maybe. You know, they're going to take 25000 off the top. That's your deductible in some circumstances. They're going to give you 25000 If you had the right coverages in place and you didn't lie on the application. So talk to us a little bit about the application, Bob. How's that changed over the course of the last handful of years? And uh, what are people, uh, what can they expect now when they go to get their new standalone policy written? A longer, more complicated application and process. I think that's what they should <laughs> expect. So um, a lot of things have changed over the last four-ish years, three to four years, and this has got nothing to do with COVID necessarily. This is how many claims 
have been requested and submitted to carriers, uh, those insurance carriers, many of them writing cyber policies that they've never had experience writing in the past, pricing them too low to try to build a book of business and get people in the door and get people, quote unquote, used to paying for cyber insurance. Uh, and then claims come in and they're upside down. So that has triggered a much more rigorous application process. The half page application is now five pages, seven pages, 10 pages. Uh, we've even seen them longer than that, but five to seven is the norm. And now they want to know everything. They want to know, do you have, you know, as we talked about in our last episode, multi-factor authentication. Do you have it? If you don't have it, it's, it's an absolute deal breaker. They will ask if you have it. Do you have it everywhere? Do you have it on Microsoft 365 if you're using that platform? Uh, if you have it, do you have it for every account, including administrator accounts? If the answers are no, you're not getting a policy. I think you could write that down prick your finger and write it in blood. It's not going to happen. Um, and you will go, this is what the insurance agents say, you will go naked for a time being until you can actually prove that you have those protections in place. And then they'll consider covering you. So uh, those, you know, they'll ask, have you had losses? Have you had, um, what's your backup uh, product look like? Do you have a backup that runs every single day, runs once a week, runs less frequently than that, God forbid. Um, <laughs> they are terrible things, but do you have multiple copies of your backups? Do you have uh, a copy on-site, a copy off-site? Uh, is it encrypted? Uh, they want to know that if you are in a jam and you need not only the cyber insurance company to write you a check to pay the ransomware, reimburse you for the ransom payment, uh, buy you a new server because it's covered under your business interruption policy. How are you going to get your data back? Do you have your data anywhere that's accessible and restorable? Do you test your backups? Yeah. Well, there's a huge one. You know, do you test your backups at least once a year? Do you have a DR plan to recover? You know, the stuff hits the fan. What do you do? Do you have a plan to say how do I react? They don't like to hear no to that question because they know you're running around with your hair on fire and you're probably not going to get your business back. Well, and I think that brings a, a good point to part of the evolution of this. You mentioned um, organizations were getting cyber liability insurance with very little underwriting. A lot of claims happened. Insurers uh, stopped offering these lines of business. Yeah, um, and I think there was a common misconception at one point um, that, okay, I've got the cyber insurance, so I don't really need to do all this other protection stuff because I've got the insurance to back me up. It sounds like they finally fixed that problem, and now you can't get the insurance without the protection, which reduces everybody's risk along the way, not only from a financial loss standpoint, but from a business operations standpoint. I think that is, has been the tipping point, Mike. That's exactly Good. the way to describe it is uh, people bought insurance, um, and hope for the best with respect to securing their environment. Yeah, I got an old tape back up, but yeah, whatever. It's worked all these years, at least we think it has. Nobody's ever tested it. And then you, you, know, you have a, an incident and you need to recover from it and then you find out the problem. And then your insurance agent says, you're using tape? What do you mean you're using tape? You know, that's unreliable 80% of the time. It's really a shared responsibility model. Though. It, that's exactly what this comes down to. And the, the carriers have gotten, uh, not themselves, they've gotten smarter, but they've hired smarter people that are technology aware as opposed to insurance specialists. Sure. And those people are, they're literally testing your network uh, to make sure that the answers to the questions that they've asked are valid. They're looking, you know, just like compl any compliance, they're looking for evidence. Sure. You know, do you, uh, show me that backup. Can you recover? Yeah. Prove it. Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's a lot, was a long time coming. Yeah. Um, and I think this, uh, you know, causes a lot of organizations to make sure they're taking their cybersecurity uh, as seriously as they should with the risk that, that, uh, that comes to their business. So yeah. thank you for that information, Bob. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Kyber Clips.
Hello folks, thanks very much for uh, joining us for another episode of Kyber Clips. We appreciate you joining us and learning a little bit about cybersecurity and what we do here at Kyber. Just uh, if you're interested in subscribing, hit the button down below, smash the like button, and reach out to us at sales at kybersecure.com. Thanks again.